Welcome back, everyone, to Talking It Out with Mike and Brian. Today's episode, everyone, is going to be a little bit different, and we're going to be talking about some very sensitive subjects. So before we get started, I just want to give a content warning for all our listeners out there that we're going to be discussing topics of sex, lack of consent, and sexual assault. We just want to make sure that this is a safe space for everyone involved. So please, please, please take note before continuing on to the rest of this episode. Absolutely, bro. As Brian said, today we're doing things a little bit different. Uh, if you watch tonight's episode of The Bachelorette, you have seen Katie's group date uh, with Nick Vial. The men were encouraged to be vulnerable, uh, to dig deep, and it was truly remarkable, incredible to see how much these men were willing to share. And besides the story that the men had to share, we obviously saw our bachelorette, Katie, reveal a story from her past that she said that not even her mother knew about. I'm so incredibly proud of Katie uh, for being so yes. brave and just, you know, to share that story on camera. Like you said, her, her mother didn't even know. This is a, And this is just a conversation that we need to talk about more. It truly is. As a certified sex and intimacy coach, I'm here to tell you that the absolute most important component of any sexual encounter is consent. Absolutely, Mike. So with that being said, let's just get right into this conversation around consent and what we saw in tonight's episode. So let's bring on Katie Thurston to Talking It Out. Katie, welcome to Talking It Out. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, it's amazing to have you on. Yeah, absolutely amazing to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Now, I just want to, first things first, you are doing an incredible job as the Bachelorette. I mean, you are making decisions. They are firm. Like, you're not messing around in there. <laughs> we love to see And it. I appreciate that. We love to see that. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was in LA last week and I saw you on a billboard and it just warmed my heart up. It was so cool to see Aww. you on a billboard. <laughs> it's still weird to me. I'm not totally used to that yet. I mean, who is? Sorry. All uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what our producer said. That's my baby. <laughs> we love it. Uh, but again, I want to echo what Brian said. We truly appreciate you being on. Uh, we saw the episode. Uh, we adore your strength. You know, there's so many people that you will never meet that and you of course you'll meet thousands of people as well but i'm talking about the people that you'll never meet but you don't know how much you touch them right and i just had to get that off my chest first and foremost i was one of those people that you touched so thank you thank you yeah. i appreciate that now katie today we're talking about consent and just for our listeners out there i just want to give a quick definition the definition definition of consent is permission for something to happen or agreement to do something. And this is what consent is not. It's when someone says no, the absence of a no, saying yes while you're intoxicated or otherwise incapable of giving consent, not saying anything, repeatedly asking someone to say yes, or pressuring them to say yes until they do. And, uh, go ahead Mike. I was gonna to add to that. Uh, whether someone says yes or no, it doesn't, that's one thing. But for people sometimes feel like just because you're in a relationship with someone that their body is automatically yours when that's never the case either, right? So Katie, everybody saw tonight's episode. And again, we first have to thank you for bravely speaking out about your experience on the episode of The Bachelorette and also for joining us for this immensely important conversation. Um, so I want to start out by asking you, what were your initial hopes uh, for this group date with Nick Vial? You know, I'll be honest. I think all of us going into the date thought it was going to be more like drama, like spill the tea, what's in the DMs, like chaos, right? But then as we all sat there and started to open up, it actually became this very intimate setting of being vulnerable and sharing these very deep stories that are personal to each of us in our own way. And you know, going into it, I didn't think I was going to ever share something like that. Um, but after hearing these men really just open up and, and cry and share things that they probably thought the same thing that they would never open up and share. 
I just felt so comforted and supported in this like safe circle. And I was like, I, I just had to let them know my side, you know, my story. Yeah, I, I can, I'm pretty sure I can speak for all of us watching. That was powerful to see you as the lead also take that same stance of being vulnerable, you know, of sharing your heart, because uh, it made you more relatable, right? As the lead, we, you know, we always put you guys on a pedestal, which is to be so, uh, but it was just so impactful to see that and watch that. Uh, you said you were going in there thinking, okay, we're going to talk about the DMs, keep it like PG or whatever. Uh, how that make you, your feelings grow in, with those individuals in the room? I just appreciated that they weren't going to hide anything, you know, and you guys only saw like a very small, you know, version of what we all talked about, but they were just laying it all out there, you know, and it was kind of like this like freeing moment, I think for a lot of them saying like, this is the darkest thing about me or my past. This is who I am now. This is who I was then. And it just shows that they're not trying to like fake anything, you know, yeah. that they're not trying to trick me or hide anything. They're just like, take me as I am. Here's everything. Yeah, no, so I kind of do that. Yeah, no, I, I was, I mean, it was a real tearjerker last night. Like being in that circle, I can't imagine how hard that those conversations must have been. But I think it just goes to show, I mean, with the exception of the gentleman that was talking about the platform and the whole nine, I mean, Thomas, there you go, Thomas. I mean, everybody else's story was like, you could, tell, <laughs> you, could, you could tell they dug deep and really, you know, wanted to show you that vulnerable side. So I just think it goes to show you know, how great of a group that you guys had on the show. So, I mean, I'm not really a crier, but uh, the gentleman that was talking about uh, his divorce. Yeah. Oh man. I was Hunter. Like, oh. Yeah, Hunter, what is, what is, you know, his two kids, that, that was sad uh, or just, I felt for him. And then for Connor B to talk about his infidelity, yeah, I dumb. felt, I was like, damn, I trust him more. You know, it, vulnerability does something, right? It just, it, it, it takes this monkey off of our shoulder uh, and it makes us connect so much deeper with people. Why do you feel, Katie, that, you know, cause you had spoke on like the outside of pressures and how people may view things. Why do you feel in our society, it's so hard to just be vulnerable and tell your truth? I mean, everyone's judging. We're in a, a world where no matter what you do, social media, in the public, everything's being judged constantly. And people do struggle with opening up and, and sharing their truth. I mean, I think it's just hard for people to start the conversation. And I think that's what being vulnerable does. You know, and that's kind of what that circle did is one person started to open up and then the other person was like, well, if they're gonna share, I'm gonna share. And just kind of continue this domino effect. And that's really all I hope with, you know, me sharing my story tonight, that men and women who have gone through similar experiences can start talking about, you know, something that they've gone through or, you know, parents can talk to their kids about what consent is. Because in this time when it happened, you know, the Me Too movement was, was not a thing yet. Like the whole thing about consent wasn't really a thing. So we were taught like it was our fault you know, mm. and it wasn't until later that you realize like, it's not your fault and consent is so important. Those yeah. are words I literally say in my TV series I created, uh, we got a writer put in there, it's not your fault. I love that you said that because it's, it's truly not your fault. Uh, you hit me deep because I, you know, I, I have all my ladies in my life, my women, my mom, my sister, my grandma, and you said you were kind of oblivious that you tried to get in a relationship with this individual. Like, can you, yeah. I just want to learn, that. like expand on that. Tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, it was somebody I knew, uh, when it happened and I remember like the moment it happened, like, I remember it like it was yesterday. And like, I remember the feeling in my head of just like shock and, you know, after the fact, the next day, I just remember thinking like, okay, that didn't just happen. Like, I didn't want that to happen. And, you know, when I was 20 years old, I was still very new to sex, you know, so it wasn't something that I was just like so casually having at that time. And so I just was in denial and I wanted to be in a relationship with him so that it it kind of took away what really happened. You know, I was like, oh, it, we did that because we wanted to. Oh, we did that because we were working on being a girlfriend and boyfriend and and we, we were going to date for a long time and it was going to be OK, you know, and so I, I pursued him. I pursued him for months and then finally had to accept that one, he did not want me in that way and and to what happened is exactly what happened so it's kind of like you were trying to convince yourself 
that this could move forward into a relationship. Like, I'm just curious. I mean, obviously, if you're not comfortable sharing, like, what was the relationship like after it happened? I mean, you talk about eventually he just didn't want anything with you, but like, was there uneasiness? Did he notice that there was something heavy on your chest? No, I'll be honest. In in the months afterwards, I don't even think he knows what he did was wrong, even to this day. You know, mm. I, I think, you know, when this, this episode is airing and people that grew up with me are gonna talk about it, I really don't think he's gonna know at that time what he did was wrong. Because again, those conversations weren't a thing back then. You know, we right. weren't educating men and women on what consent is and what it means. And like you said in the beginning of this, if you are intoxicated, that's not the time to be accepting consent. Yeah, it's not no, absolutely. That's one of the big things that Air Force taught us. Alcohol does not mean yes. Alcohol, it, it, alcohol is like, it means no and no and no, just don't. Uh, how, what was your relationship prior? I mean, after, I wanna know, like Brian asked, I wanna know that too. But for people out there, you know, from what media has taught us is that it's someone you don't know, right? So tell me about your relationship with this individual prior like it was it was very much like someone i had a crush on you know there's there's that comfort of who this guy is because you've grown up with him and you knew him and i mean yeah we were in a situation where we are making out and we we do have our clothes off but like not fully and we weren't dating and again i was 20 and at that time i was still pretty innocent to having you know sexual relationships with people like i was very strict on like oh we have to be boyfriend girlfriend i'm gonna wait this long like i had all these rules and boundaries for myself and so then for this this moment to happen, it was the first time that one, I ever had sex outside of a relationship. And, and two, we just never even talked about it. That, I'll be honest, like I had my underwear on and, and he, he moved it aside. Didn't even like, it wasn't like I took them off and was giving the wrong signals. He just moved it over. Uh, he didn't put a condom on. He didn't ask if, he, if I wanted him to have a condom on. He didn't ask if I was on birth control. Like all these red flags of like, he, he did everything wrong in those moments. And then in the, in what happened, you have this gut feeling of like, you feel sick, like you just know this is wrong. But it, it really took, honestly, probably the Me Too movement to really sink in like everything about that was not okay. And that, yes, while we were making out and I'm drunk and I'm in this bed with him, it's not my fault that that happened. And after the fact, I mean, was he just like nonchalant about it? Like you said, he didn't, you don't think he knows to this day what he did. Like, so he just went about his business and he was like, normal conversation with you? Yeah, I mean, we all we all continue to hang out. My birthday is January 3rd, so I'm sure like that following weekend, we all went out as a group. You know, like I said, I was, I was pursuing him, trying to then make it so that he was my boyfriend, so that it was okay what happened. And that didn't happen. We never ended up dating and eventually we just kind of went our own separate ways. Uh, wow. Shout out for being a Capricorn, you know, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. You. Um, you talked about like you guys and my, I just put my head down for a moment because I just appreciate your strength and courage so much. Yeah, and like seriously. this badass energy, I'm loving it. Was this y'all's first encounter of kissing? Like, tell me, I want to go deep into that prior prior relationship. Had y'all gone on dates before? Had y'all flirted before? Yeah. Like, tell me that. Um, and so in high school, like nothing had ever happened. I don't even think we ever kissed in high school. Um, but, you know, you kind of keep in touch with these friends, especially as you like graduate from high school. And we just kind of ran in similar crowds. And even it's hard because it's so long ago, you know, at this point, and because he wasn't a special figure in my life. It's hard to remember all the moments before that, you know, um, I don't even know if that was like our first kiss or not. But I know it's hard to bring up. Yeah. No, and it is okay. Like I, I'm happy to be as like open and honest, but I do feel that certain things are just kind of like blocked permanently. You know, he's not someone I cherish in my memories. You know. Yeah. Um, but we had never been, you know, intimate like that. Did you, uh, after the fact? I mean, obviously, it's, this was ten years ago. Did you bring it up ever, like during that time that you kind of were trying to date him? Did you mention anything that happened that night? No, because, you know, like, like I said, when you're in that time, we weren't taught like right and wrong when it came to consent. So even even though my gut, it felt wrong, it was still like, well, you were in bed with him. Well, you know him Well, you were drunk. Like you you didn't tell him to stop once it happened. You know, you you continued. Um, you didn't report it. You didn't tell anybody. And so you, you build all these things that make it feel like like, oh, that was my fault. I put myself in that situation. 
And there was a period of time where I just kind of moved on. But then when the Me Too movement started and you start to like learn and think and reflect, that's when I was like, oh, wow, like that's actually not okay. And that's why I felt that way for so long. Yeah. Um, what One of the things that blew me away from watching the episode, and again, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for the strength that you're showing right now talking to us about this, um, was the fact that you revealed something on air to millions of viewers that you hadn't even told your mom. Like, what was that like, keeping that secret from your loved ones? And like, where, where was your outlet? Like, did you have an outlet, therapy, counseling, anything? Like, who could you talk to about that? Yeah, I mean, that was probably the hardest part was knowing that my mom was gonna, you know, either I had to tell her before this episode aired or she was gonna find out, you know? And in those moments of when that was happening, I, I didn't have anyone to talk to, you know, cause you feel ashamed, you feel dirty, you feel like it's your fault. Um, and then moving forward, I have two girlfriends who know about it and that's it. And so again, I, I didn't expect to even bring it up in that setting. And I didn't even realize kind of the domino effect of what it's going to have, you know, the impact. And in some ways it's so just like liberating to take this negative moment and make it such a positive and like start these conversations and educate people on their resources and know that they are not alone and that this has happened to so many men and women, but people don't talk about it because they feel ashamed and embarrassed. Yeah, so many people feel ashamed. What was that domino effect like after the fact that you said, you know, the person who arguably loves you the most in this world, your mother, all of our mothers, like, you know, you didn't tell her because uh, you said you were ashamed. Was that is, and then what was that domino effect after when it came to to dating, when it came to being intimate with someone physically? Like, how was that for you? I think for at least five years after that, I did not enjoy having sex. Like, I just had this really negative relationship with it. Um, but of course, like when you're in a relationship, that's important to have this chemistry. And so then it kind of creates, a, like you said, a domino effect of like, well, he has his needs. I want to give him that. But then you're like forcing it. And then, or when you're not having sex, then he's angry. And it's just like, it's this really just unhealthy thing that you're just trying to get out of. Um, but you're digging this hole deeper and deeper by like forcing it or fighting about it. And, you know, I had to really learn how to have a healthy relationship with sex, but also how to communicate with your partner about the expectations and, and what sex is and, and how to kind of set boundaries for each other. Katie, I haven't said this before, but I'll say it to you and only you, and if someone else hears it, they hear it. Um, I'm a certified sex coach and certified intimacy coach, and you just hit something that I haven't said pretty much ever. I remember I was in a relationship with my ex and uh, I came home one day, I was in the guard at the time, I was in Dallas in the guard, I came home back to San Antonio and I walked in the door and she started crying. And um, she started crying because she figured that I wanted to have sex because I haven't seen her in like four days and you just touched my heart when you said he has needs. And the reason I became a certified intimacy and sex coach was because I wanted to learn I never want my woman to feel, well, he has needs. Because I want you to know and every woman to know, bitch, you got needs too, right? <laughs> you have needs too. I do that to stop myself from crying, but you have needs as well. And for that's just, that just you touched me with that one right there. Uh, because I understand that, right? When you're in a relationship with someone, you want to be pleased and you want to please as well. Uh, I, just how do you deal with that? I, how, how do how do women just show so much strength? How do you, Katie, so, show so much strength when you were taken advantage of, yet and still you, you tell your two homegirls, you know, you love your mom to death, but you you, you can't tell your mom because you're her you're her pride and you're her light, right? So I get that, I understand that. Um, so you tell your two homegirls that are close to you, but then you try to move on with life, and you try to like almost suppress it, like. How do you even have sex? Is it more of a rage sex or is it like, tell me about that. I genuinely want to know, I'm so curious. And just, I just want to be better myself. Like how I've progressed over the years? Yeah, how have you, how you, how have you progressed and gotten 
and, and gotten so to this stage. Yeah, I mean, obviously it took time, a lot of time and a lot of failed relationships, um, a lot of them that were centered around sex being an issue. And that was when I was like, I'm just in this vicious cycle of, you know, failed relationships because of the relationship I have with sex. And so I want to say it was probably within the last three years that I finally was very firm in my decisions in terms of like, if I didn't want to have sex, I said no, and I meant it. And I was never going to force myself to do anything for a man that I didn't want to do. And I think that was probably the first step to building this healthy relationship. Because if you start forcing yourself to have sex when you don't want to, then your body, your mind, you start to create this negative association with sex in general, and you're just setting yourself up for failure. And so for me, the, the first step that I had to do was not try to please my man if it was something that I didn't want to do mentally or physically in that moment. But how do you do that though? What is that? How, what is the vehicle to get you to that strength that you now hold? Like, is it is it strictly just time or is it talking to the homies or like what, what, what was the thing? Was it a book that you read, a podcast that you listened to? You know, something that just came over you one day and said, fuck it. I mean, yeah, honestly, just time, you know, time and, and the older you get them and the more failed relationships you have, you really have to start digging deeper and deeper, you know, in your early twenties, you're like, ah, it's whatever. And then you hit like 25 and you're like, okay, what's happening. And then all of a sudden you're like 27, 20, 29. You're like, I need to figure my shit out. I need to figure out what's wrong, you know? And so I, there's not like a book that I read or like some documentary I watch. It's just like self-reflection, you know? And I think that happens, especially in these last years of the, the last year of the pandemic is people are reflecting a lot on their lives and where they're at and what they need to do to like, to make it better. And so yeah. for me, it, it took 10 years of self-reflection and growth to figure out how to have a healthy relationship with myself, with sex, with, you know, my future partner. Katie, take me, I'm curious about these, what you said are failed relationships. Like, can you take me back to the relationships that you had after the incident, like how tough were those conversations? Like, because obviously, you know, you didn't want to talk about sex. You didn't want to have sex at certain points. And then, you know, you have this person that supposedly cares about you that does want to have those uh, intimate moments with you. Like, were you able to tell them about what happened or was this something that you kept from them and they didn't really understand what was going on yeah i would say my three relationships after that had no idea and i just tried to keep that to myself but then you know we continued to fight over the amount of sex that we were or were not having and and i would just have this this negative feeling of you know what intimacy was you know like i'm sure so many people can relate when you're basically forcing yourself to have sex it does not feel good and but you're doing it to please your partner but now you're creating this negative association where this it's like this ongoing pattern where you can no longer be turned on by your partner because your mind and body remembers the last time you had sex when you forced it, that it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And so for my my next three relationships, I never spoke about it. I tried to overcome it. Um, the issues were the same with every single one of them. And it wasn't until these past couple of years where I had to stop doing that. And the first step was, if you don't wanna have sex, tell them you don't wanna have sex and don't feel bad about it. Yeah. So that was basically, you just let them know straight up. Okay. Oh yeah. I mean, so then my, my more recent ones, like they would, I would, they would know the story and we talk about consent and, um, how that impacted me early on. And I think it just really sets the boundaries very early of like, okay, she's had an issue before with people kind of guilt tripping her about sex or like trying to force it. And you don't want to start off your relationship like that. And so yeah. just being able to talk about it and just have healthy boundaries of like intimacy, I think is the perfect way to start your relationship. I mean, absolutely. How can you have a bad relationship when you started off with intimacy, right? When you started off with courageous conversation, truth, uh, that's a, for everyone listening, that's a pretty much wonderful baseline to start with, right? Um, I love, love that. Were you in love with any of these, the, the first three relationships that you had just spoke of? Oh yeah. I mean, these are, these are, I've always dated with the hopes of marrying somebody. I never casually dated, which I think is also why that incident was so big to me because I just wasn't very casual in, in sex and relationships. And so these, these next, you know, three relationships I was in, um, they were long, they were serious, but they, we, I never told them about this. 
Uh, and I, uh, you know, I think things will start to probably make sense to them if they end up watching this episode or hear about it. Okay, it's, they, no, it's, it's no, it's no if. Baby, you, you hot shit. They're going to yeah. watch it. They're going to listen to it. They're going to be like, okay, that's what took place. You had love and where you, you said you were in love with at least one of the three of the individuals prior. How, how can the person that you're dating be better for you? And or not even you, Katie, but for our listeners out there, how can if you know the person that you're dating, your partner, be better for you if your other partner has been through trauma? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking just trauma in general, I think it's sexual just sexual really, trauma. Okay, then sexual trauma. It's important to to have those conversations and understand, you know, what it is, you know, because sometimes that could mean certain things are triggering when it comes to what you're doing in the bedroom, you know. Um, yeah. To put it like bluntly, like if 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 you're an aggressive type of person in bed, but then your partner was raped, that that's not going to be an experience that they want to go through, you know. So I think it's very important for uh, people who've gone through sexual trauma to discuss with their partners very openly about what they've gone through, because it's going to only help them moving forward to know how to kind of navigate that and and move away from that negative experience. So obviously the relationships after the fact, these quote unquote failed relationships that you talk about, they, because I imagine they must have constantly or whenever the situation came up, they would ask you why. And you didn't divulge what happened to you to, in either relationship. So like, what was that conflict like? Like, what would you say to kind of I don't know, I guess get them off your back or like change the subject or try to understand you in a better way. Like, what would you, what was your mechanism to cope with that? Yeah, with the, with the guys, they never actually would ask why. And that's another thing with, with relationships. You have to inquire and, and figure out things, communicate. Rather than asking why, they would just be angry. Mm. And then you're trying mm. to fix it and make, you know, you're trying to fix it uh. and make them happy. And it, you're just setting your whole relationship up to fail. Uh. Yes, speak, speak that. So powerful right there. You just said it perfectly for both parties in the relationship. One, you on your side, you were saying you're trying to f fix it, but you don't know how to say it. And him, he's just getting mad and being a dumbass and not, instead of using that, instead of being mad, you should take that emotion and use it towards conversation, use it towards just what's going on. You know, how can I help? Uh, this, is, wow, this is, I guess that's, that's, like for other women in that situation, like what is the advice that you give them to express to their significant other, the men in their lives about a similar situation? Like what advice can you give them? Well, I do want to say that sexual assault does happen to men and women. So I don't want to like separate the two, um, yeah. which is why I'm kind of using the phrase partner. But yeah. if you are a victim of sexual assault uh, and you're getting into a relationship, I think before you start to engage in a sexual relationship with that new partner, it's important to figure out the right time to explain what you've been through. Because if you're keeping that in like I was early on, then your partner's not gonna understand what's happening and you're just never really gonna sync up. You know, and, and in short, it's all just about communication, you know? I think uh, communication is always the answer, right? Always the answer, effective communication, right? Respectful, effective communication. There's levels to this shit, right? Uh, but with that being said, it's easier said than done, right? You you wouldn't have been able to communicate two months after this situation took place, right? So for that person listening, I'm I'm big on I mean I'm big on self love, right? You gotta love yourself before you love anyone else, and a part of loving yourself is accepting yourself and knowing the beauty of yourself, right? Knowing the strength that you have to continue on, right? In your in your eyes, the badass, the bachelorette, Katie Thurston. Uh, she's sexy, she's doing her thing, she's smart, she's intelligent. You got your boyfriend, you saw him in a skeleton the other day on our, the last episode we watched, <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Like, for that woman listening to you two, or she, communication just not happened. Like, her mouth, because I've been, I've known through my, uh, through what now y'all know I do for a living, I've known people say the words just don't come out. The lips just don't move, right? the tongue is just not moving for the words to be said. How can we be better for that person? 
and what could, what would you say to that person? I mean, I think one, they have to figure out when they're ready to communicate, but also there are other ways to communicate what you need to say. If talking about it like live in front of someone is not your style or you're just not at that place, write it out, journal, you know, share that with your partner later. Um, if texting is just easier because you can like read it and delete what you need and get your words organized, do whatever you need to do to communicate, however you need to communicate, but you have to at some point communicate. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I want to I go back to that conversation that you had with your mother. Mm. How hard was that? Like, take me through that, you know, and how your relationship, if at all, has changed since then. I mean, I had to tell her when I got back from, you know, filming The Bachelorette. So she just found out, you know, within the last couple of weeks leading up to this episode airing. And it was hard. <laughs> Like even talking about it now, it's very hard because, you know, she feels bad that she, you know, wasn't there for me in that moment and didn't like recognize signs or um, she felt bad that she wasn't a safe space for me to go to, um, you know, and so we both got emotional over it. And, um, but then, you know, she opens up about her story, you know, and, and that's the thing is, is so many women and men have gone through something very similar, more than we even realize. It, it's really unfortunate. And I, and I hope that, you know, we, it becomes better. Um, and that's kind of like with these, these conversations and these resources and education that we can start to have these conversations more. And, and in those moments, you know, it took me 10 years to tell my mom, you know, and that's, that's unfortunate. But, but, you, but you told her yeah. So, you know, you, you told her that, you know, you got, you, I, I, we can both see that, that that's emotional for you. Uh, so not only commend you for like speaking and telling your truth, but it's almost different when you tell the, the people that you love the most, right? Uh, so I commend you for that as well, telling your mom. I know that's a, a, a deep thing for you. Can't even imagine. Um, when you have children, how do you like give us a, your 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 form of advice when it comes to setting up a, a stage of openness that whatever happens to your child, if this were to happen to your child, God forbid it ever does, that they know that they can come to you. Like for the parents out there listening, because we all know we we try to protect those that we love the most, right? Mm -hmm. What do you say to the parents out there? I mean, I think there are parents who shy away from these conversations, but they have to happen at even such a young age about like no-no zones, or like if an adult that's not mom and dad touch you in these like no-no zones to like let them know, you know, and that, and I was never taught that growing up. Like, I don't remember any conversation about um, being touched or adults or even, even family, like cousins, brothers, sisters, whatever. Um, I think people don't realize how early these conversations need to start and how we need to make talking about sex a normal thing that it that kids are comfortable talking to their parents about because i think that's where people mess up is their kids are too embarrassed too ashamed to ask these questions to go to them for help and it's really up to the parents to offer a safe space for their their kids how do you feel about and brian i want your thoughts on this too uh, a part of my curriculum when i was going through my program uh, we did this case study and watched this, this terrible stuff and these, this girl, she was taught that her no-no zone was a cookie, right? And her teacher uh, was doing things to the cookie and she was telling her parents this. But the communication, she was like, oh, um, my teacher touched my cookie, right? And the parents were just being oblivious, thinking no big deal of it. And what we've been taught is teach your kids the proper terminology so that when they try to communicate to you, you're not being oblivious to the shit, right? Like, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Teaching your children proper terms. Yeah, I mean, I, even though it may be uncomfortable at first, I think the proper terms are essential. You know, eventually they're going to learn them anyway. Like, if they don't learn them from you, they're going to learn them from through their friends or you know things they watch or whatnot. And I think it's very important to not beat around the bush. Like, talk about those terms. So like you said, they can understand when something's going down or when they come back home and say that they've been touched in a certain area that's inappropriate, they could, you know, they'll know what's up and they could put an end to it right away. 
about you, Katie? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, it, it's hard because obviously, like, I don't have children to be able to like sympathize with the parents going through None this now. Um, mm -hmm. But I do have young nieces and nephews, and we've because I've talked with them as well. We have like a, a doll that has you know hands and feet, and you talk about it like as a human body. Like this is a no no zone down below the waist. That's a no no zone, you know. And and yeah, like by just saying it for what it is, it does help with the communication a lot better. Yeah, and I mean, what look like with this. <laughs> this is oh. <laughs> sorry. Hey, no. bud. What's up, man? <laughs> Just wants to come for the conversation. <laughs> it's just like a random tail. <laughs> my tail. Like, <laughs> like, hey, I didn't know you had a tail. What's up? It kind of was looks it, like it. Wasn't there a cat on your season or something? <laughs> yeah, Connor the cat. There you go. There we I thought go. Connor was yeah. in the house. <laughs> um, um, no, but I mean, to, to your point, Katie, I mean, with the doll, I mean, whatever it takes, you know, obviously if they're a young age, maybe they'll understand the, the big words or the proper terms, but, you know, use something that they can relate to to get your point across. And obviously if something happens, you know exactly what it is. Definitely so. Uh, I, I can't get over this because so many people go to parties. So many people drink. So many people do other things to where they're inebriated, right? What do you feel is the proper way to navigate nights out like that? I mean, it's hard because like you have to hold yourself accountable in terms of like how much you're drinking, you know, and, and knowing how to protect yourself. But on, on the same end, the person, the men, women, whoever, who's possibly going to take advantage of the situation needs to be held accountable as well. And so, you know, when oh, going out, fuck, fuck you, yeah, not just yeah, but fuck <laughs> yeah. yeah. When going out, you really have to kind of have this like support system at least for me and my friends we, we kind of like have each other's back in terms of like all right like i'm not letting you walk away with that guy like oh he's trying to take you over here that's not happening or like another thing i want to bring up because this is new to me especially as we start to go to like little mvp drinking tables at these clubs and whatnot i've heard that that people will actually spike like the orange juice the mixers with like drugs so that when the girls are invited to the tables these vip tables and with the vodka and they're pouring their orange juice they're they're being tricked date rape drugs yeah yeah mm -hmm. can't, can't even she can't even drink orange juice and she's like <laughs> i mean it's just it's, it's unfortunate but like you it you it's have to have your your support system with you when you're going out and you know buy your own drinks uh don't leave your drinks unattended um you know, it's unfortunate, like as much as I can say, these people need to be held accountable, there's still gonna be fuckheads out there, you know? No, for sure, probably yeah. like it is. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I wanted you to speak on that, uh, cause you know, I love my sister dearly. Uh, and she liked to party, and, you know? Uh, I love the, I love when I see women uh, doing the buddy system, right? I, I love that. Let me, I wanna tell you guys a story. Brian, I think I told you already, Katie, I haven't told you. Uh, maybe a few months ago, I was with, a group of ladies and myself, and it was a lady that I had been messing with dating, and she got wasted, right? Uh, I take her home, and she was like trying to get me to do stuff. She was like literally grabbing me or whatever. And I'm like, fuck that. I was extremely paranoid, extremely like uh, had anxiety and was scared. I went home uh, the next day. Uh, she's like, yo, are you mad at me? I'm like, nah, like, you know, you was messed up. I wasn't going to do nothing. Hey, tell me why she told me. She told her homegirls this and they started crying. They started I mean, crying. And you were a gentleman. Yeah. That opened my eyes so much because what I did to me was extremely small and just you know, the right thing. They, to do they were used but, to that. But exact that's the bad part. That's the, the bigger part. That's the real part I'm trying to get to, like the nucleus, right? The fact that her homegirls were crying because that's not what they have seen to be normal. I want the men listening to know. And listen to that story. Listen to Katie's story. Like, we got women crying because we doing the right thing. I remember my homie Tyler once put on a, a tweet. He was like, "We got girls out here being happy for the smallest acts of gentlemanness, right?" That we need to raise the bar. Raise the standards. Out there. Yeah. We need to raise this. Like, it blew my mind. Oh yeah. yeah, I mean the the guys that stand out the most are the ones who are like, 
can I order you your Uber home? Or like, yeah. you can stay here. I'm going to be in my room. Like, here's the couch, here's a blanket. Like the respectful gentleman. And First like you off, said, it's, he should, he should it's give so you the small. He should stay on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> like speak on that, Katie. Like what, like, what do you have to say to the young men out there, who, you know, who are navigating these, you know, intimate moments and sexual experiences with women? Like what advice for you do you have for them? Yeah, well, I mean, for starters, consent. And if you're drinking, consent's just not really an option at that time. Don't even like, as in as in getting a yes while they're intoxicated doesn't really count, you know? And so your better move as, as a guy is to take care of her in the way that you know, get her some water, make sure she gets home, drive her home if you're able to drive, you know, whatever it is to, to make her feel like she's being taken care of in a time where she's very vulnerable is the way to go. Because if you're gonna end up, you know, hooking up with her, who's to say that she was gonna do that if she was sober, you know? And now you're setting yourself yes. up to to get in trouble. Um, you're setting yourself up for for her to go through her own trauma. You know, it's just, it's never it's never a good thing, you know? I'm just, yeah. I'm gonna be a bit more harsh. I'm gonna be a bit more harsh, Katie. You ain't got no game to all the fellas out there if you can't hook up while she's sober. Katie, you are, you know, Jay-Z said a line, the best gift is anonymous to anonymous. You truly are giving a gift to our listeners out there, to all the people that get to see you. Um, you really are. I mean, people think we just go on TV shows, find love, but these people put us in our hearts, right? Mm -hmm. These people are looking up to you, Katie, and I just salute to you for being brave. And, and for, and I mean brave about having a conversation with your mom, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what touches you, you know. That's what, and I know that your mom probably felt she couldn't be there to protect you, you know. And I know that you guys have obviously spoken to let her know that it's not her fault whatsoever. But uh, that shows bravery. Uh, that shows vulnerability. And by us being vulnerable, we literally get more connected. It's almost mm -hmm. funny how we're so scared to be vulnerable. But by being vulnerable, our connections grow that much stronger with people. It's just crazy. And one of the things I loved on the episode tonight was like it kind of brought everything we're talking about full circle. Full like circle. you're talking about vulnerability, Mike. I want to talk about Michael A. On your date, it's like he asks you, can I kiss you? Yeah. And, you know, right there, we're talking about consent. And I thought he did it in like such a playful and like it, like before I would be like, oh, never ask a girl if you can kiss her. Like kind of like if you're feeling it, just go in. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was really cute the way he did it. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, do I, it. like there's ways to do it. And like he had just basically spilled his heart to you about his story, which was absolutely incredible. Um, kudos to Michael A. And, you know, I just thought it was a sweet moment. And I feel like you're bringing out like the best in these guys. And it's just evident yes. by what's on the screen. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I really have a great group of men and it was important for me that they had the opportunity to share their story. You know, I didn't wanna be closed off to anybody. And I think by being so open and vulnerable with them and accepting of them, you know, slowly you'll start to see more and more people open up and have their own stories to share. And it's just, it's just a really good group. And I, I think it's so rare. So I've heard for a bachelorette to be really excited for mental all because I really just had such a great relationship with these guys and I wish nothing but the best for them. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. I got to shout out to Mike as well because Mike, uh, I believe Mike P is his name. He, uh, he was, I, I love this moment. I'll start, I jumped up at the TV. I was like, yeah. Like he was like, yo, Katie, I got to let you know from all of us, this is how we feel. That was such a G moment for me. I love that. For me, the bigger piece is that this is, this aired tonight and that there's that, you know, PSA at the end of like resources for people to reach out to, you know, and I think that's all I can want is for people to start these conversations and, and get the help that they either they need or to educate themselves so they can avoid it going in, you know, into the future. See, Katie, with the love we have here, I'm talking <laughs> out. You know, we just love each other. Yeah, so sweet. Katie, we love you. We appreciate you. I want to see you flourish. I want to continue to throw popcorn at my screen at the dumbass zone that ain't got no game. I want to continue to like root you on throughout the season. Uh, Thank you. I so appreciate you. You know, Brian so appreciates you. Absolutely. 
Uh, what is uh, what was that resource again uh, that they shared tonight? Can you tell us that? Yeah, it's rain, R-A-I-N-N, so rain with two N's, dot org. Thank and you. that's where there's all these resources that people can, can use. Absolutely love that. Um, is there, I mean, just like, what's the future for Katie? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I'm taking it day by day and, and every week is just so different and wild as, as these episodes are airing back. So uh, to be determined, really, <laughs> I have no I, idea. I, I, I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. It's probably the most important question. Are yes. you happy? <laughs> are you happy? I am happy. Yes. Okay. I, I won't even downplay it with you guys. I am happy. It's all we could ask for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shouldn't even ask this question. I, mean, I, like, I like having too much fun. Did, <laughs> Katie. Yeah. Did Caitlin and Tasha steal the dildos? <laughs> Actually, I don't know. I don't know at what if it'll sh like show, but there was a point where I gave them both a gift bag, and in each of their gift bags was the same purple dildo. And like, we all just kind of like, we're playing around with it and like fighting with it. I don't think it's like safe for oh, TV. Oh, to so be a fly on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe like YouTube will publish it. I have no idea, but it's, Didn't they, it was great. Weren't Jason and Zach like there for some point or I don't know, maybe they yeah, did need it. I, Zach was definitely there and Tasha's like, oh, he's gonna hate me right now. <laughs> Exactly. Like, I'm walking off. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, I do want the fellas what are you, out what there are you to know. Doing? <laughs> for the for the fellas listening to this, it is let your have fun with your girl. She want to use a toy while you doing your hey. thing. It's not diminishing you, homie. Like she's Seriously. getting off with you. Don't be Everyone intimidated. Happy. You'd be happy. If anything, if it helps <laughs> you get them off faster, like even better. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I, bro, why Brian, not, Brian? I don't understand why some guys be tripping. Like, they're intimidated. They're insecure. They think that, you know, this is replacing them. It's like, you can't you replace you can't your ass if you can't get with it. Uh, that's <laughs> facts. Facts. We all have the same goal. It's getting there at the end. So however yes. it happens together, let's just make it happen, you know? Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, and on that note. You. Yeah. With consent. <laughs> with, yeah, with, with consent. There you go. There you go. Uh, well, Katie, we just want to thank you again your courage, your bravery, um, you know, we know it's, it wasn't easy, but you definitely are a role model for tons of young women out there, including men as well, you know, for speaking your truth and, um, you know, just bringing the, those tough conversations to light. So we appreciate you. Thanks guys, I appreciate it. It's nice to have it with two men because I think people don't do that enough, you know? Man, I. Uh... I love having Katie on today. She was amazing. It was it was strength uh, personified, and I just want to say, like, when you open yourself up and courageously give that vulnerability, you know, you can receive that blessing of connection and help another. You know, one that will stay anonymous. And uh, Katie did a phenomenal job. You know, I think it's good for people to hear men speak about this as well because I, I've heard so many women say that they're scared. You know, and, yeah, and, 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 and or they hate. You know, they really dislike, you know, they really just don't trust. Um, and so these conversations here on Talking It Out, uh, I know we're, we're, we're breaking that shit. We got to. Uh, but for men and women, if you do not hear the words, yes, Y-E-S, from the person you are having any kind of intimate encounter with, then you should not proceed. It's that simple, homie. Do not proceed. Plain and simple as that. It's 2021. We have survived a global pandemic. Uh, we were survived. The world is just so different now, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of one another. Let's start by asking for consent from our partner. And again, the uh, resource that we shared on the show uh, that Katie shared was, you can go to rain, that's R-A-I-N-N.org, uh, or you can go to uh, our podcast uh, social platform that's Talking It Out VN or Batch Nation uh, Pod, uh, or just Brian and I social, uh, our socials as well. And we would love to give any resource that we possibly can. This is a subject that we don't take lightly, uh, I for damn sure do not. I know Brian doesn't either. So I truly appreciate you guys listening today. Make sure that you guys write us. Make sure that you guys uh, DM us, leave comments. Uh, check out rain.org. It's rain.org. My apologies. Um, and just we truly want to grow with you guys. This is a community. And so just reach out to us. Uh, try and do the best we can because uh, we care about you guys. And here on Talking It Out, we talk about all things relationships. And this is a big part of it that so many people are scared to talk about but we will always uh, bring the best to you.
So let us know how you feel. Not even going to try to follow it up, my man. That was perfect. Well said. Couldn't agree with you more. And to you all out there, our listeners, thank you so much for tuning into today's episode on a very important episode. And again, a huge thank you to the brave, our brave bachelorette, Katie Thurston, for coming on and sharing her story. Absolutely. Love you guys. Have a good one. And make sure, baby, 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 please. You know I can't let y'all go. You almost forgot, Mike. You almost forgot. I can't let you go, baby. You're going to hear this. Don't DM me no more. Until you hit that subscribe. Love y'all. That's real love right there. Holy